Hello guys, welcome to our channel. We're now discussing England. England have beaten India by 227 runs, something that we didn't expect. None of us predicted it. And I want to get your initial thoughts on this. I'll give you some stats before you start. This is the first time Kohli in his captaincy career has lost four consecutive tests in a row. So that's a stat. Another one, in the last 10 years, England have lost three home tests to England and have lost only one to the rest of the world. So I want to get your initial reactions, Neko. England played very close to the perfect test match. They were brilliant from the very first day to the last. Uh, a huge amount of planning has gone into this, obviously, but that would be true whether they'd, <laughs> whether they'd won or lost. They, both of these teams prepare very professionally. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about the pitch being this and the pitch being that, but Root was a different class. I mean, we, we've talked about it a few times, but Root was, Root was different class in that first innings, well supported by Sibley uh, and by, by Stokes as well, some other contributions. Uh, and I think India didn't, weren't awful. I think they probably picked slightly the wrong team, but I thought Ishant and Bumrah both bowled pretty well. Uh, Ashwin, I thought, was uh, was pretty tidy for most of the most of the game. Uh, and then in the in the second... And then obviously, you know, putting 600 on the board puts a huge amount of pressure, but we've seen that um, England have scored runs in India in the past and and, and it's not gone so well. But, you know, you know, there's a big difference between even 450 and there, and nearly and nearly 600, 578. Uh, and then a combination of that scoreboard pressure and some really good bowling um, throughout throughout the Test match. I mean, you know, Anderson was unbelievable today. Uh, that, that over to Gill and, and Rahane was, was astonishing. I read a... Uh, you know, we, I'm not a huge fan of Winviz. I actually don't. I'm not. Yeah. It's not so much the not so much the um, not so much the accuracy of it, but the, but the point of it. I don't, you know, I don't want to know who's winning. That's why I'm watching. Uh, to to some extent, but uh, I think this is quite instructive. Uh, in, India England's chances of winning went from 42 percent at the start of the over to 76 percent at the end of it. Uh, Shuman Gillard looked beautiful up until that point, and he got the perfect bit of reverse swing bowling and then Rahane could have been out on any one of the balls that he faced in that over it was that good uh and he was good in the first innings as well I thought he and Bess bowled really well at Kohli and Rahane uh after lunch on day two before Pantam Pujara got going Stokes did his bit with the ball um you know again that late in swing you'd seen him get very out Kohli in the fourth innings a couple of times by then you know Kohli was you know even he was would have struggled to to save to save the day at that, at that point. Uh, Archer more than did his bit, got both openers in the first innings, got uh, got that last wicket, and definitely gets an assist for the Ushwin wicket in the second innings. And then the spinners, the little best bowled very well alongside Anderson in that first in that first test. He, you know, in the first innings, rather. He didn't get particularly... He didn't bowl particularly well in the second innings, and certainly that weird spell where Coley hit him for three three fours with those, with those boundaries is going to ask the, some of the same questions we've been asking. And I thought Leach was, was very good. Uh, he very accurate. Um, you know, again, came back really well from being taken apart by Rishabh Pant. That's the sort of spell that can knock a bowler's confidence completely. But you know, we on on the on the sports gazette, we've written about Jack Leach and his incredible resilience um, and what the stuff he's had to go through to make his career as good as good as it has been and take it as far as he has been. And he came back, and I think he bowled in a really controlled manner um, and and was a was a great foil to the to the rest. Um, yeah. England played nearly the perfect Test match. India were a little bit below par, not terribly. Um, I didn't take the half chances England did and as ever in test cricket sometimes those little advantages build up to huge winning margins um, England were brilliant yeah and we'll get to each of the talking points individually in just a minute but just before we get to that it was Root's 26th win as test captain the most by an England, uh, England skipper obviously there was a lot of debate at the end of yesterday if he was making the right call, declaring that late in the innings, a lot of critics said, uh, I think he's left it too late to try and take 10 wickets against an Indian batting lineup that's good against spin will be difficult on that day five pitch. But obviously, he's, he went out to all critics wrong. Did you, at the end of day four, think he declared too late as well? I don't know if he necessarily declared too late. I thought the way that they got to the declaration was really weird, particularly Don Bess's innings. I mean, the... Joss Butt like always gets criticised, and I always feel the need to defend him. But um, for, his, for his approach, I mean, I mean, he scored at sixty runs per hundred balls. It's not it's not awful. It's just below four and over, um, which is quite good for for Test cricket. I thought Bess's approach was a bit weird. Um, yeah, I thought I probably did, and certainly the way England were going about it didn't really make much sense. I certainly didn't really see the need for Archer, Leach, and Anderson to be to be batting 
um, or what, well, what they were technically they forced into a declaration when they got all out because they didn't seem like they were going to be declaring anytime soon. And I think uh, it's channel yeah, four, I think on channel four when they asked Alistair Cook about the declaration, he said there must be some discussion going on there because they must be trying to save the test match first before going out and trying to win it. Because they they showed on camera Jimmy Anderson having a long conversation with the coach and Joe Root, so there must have been some thought process going into it, and obviously it paid off for them to win the Test match so convincingly. Yeah, there was a long discussion. I thought it was quite funny. But a few hours before that, uh, uh, Root was chatting to Chris Silverwood. They wandered off. Um, I don't know what they were doing. Maybe, maybe getting a coffee or something, and then came back and nothing had happened and nothing had changed. And Root just sat down next to Archer, who was padded up, and they had a little bit, a little bit of a joke. A certain amount of. Uh, a certain amount of trolling everybody going on going on there, which Joe Root is, you know, in his kind of cheeky way is, is not averse to. And I think it, it's good that it's a good sign for England when Joe Root is having fun out there. And, uh, you know, in this in this form, who wouldn't be? Uh, well, actually, I can think of quite a few cricketers who wouldn't be even in this form, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it becomes a minor footnote because England won by 227 runs and probably it should have been at the time, but it is the sort of thing that, you know, on commentary it's under the cricket... Point, right? It's on like, commentary, uh, yeah, on commentary on guerrilla cricket, like it's an easy thing, it's an observable thing to to come. But I wasn't on commentary yesterday, but I was watching um, and and producing from home, and you know the commentators were getting a bit annoyed about it, and and you know you can understand why. But um, in the end, it wasn't even spin necessarily. You know, Leach took a, Leach took a forfeit, but um, you know Archer took a wicket, Anderson took a wicket. You know, it was, it was Anderson really who who, who, did, who was the difference um, in this. In the second things, well, that and obviously the the huge, um, the huge target. Um, yeah, and I'll be just slowly moving towards India for a small bit, if you don't mind. Uh, we'll start with the test match at the start of test match when Akshar Patel. We'd found out the day before the test that Akshar Patel's out. We thought, okay, now Kuldeep Yadav has to play. He sat out throughout the Australia series. Kuldeep Yadav, this is his time. Even the bowling coach, I believe, uh, in one of the press conferences, Bharat Arun said. Kuldeep Yadav will play this series. This will be the series Kuldeep Yadav time has come. And then they go out and bring in Shabazz Nadeem instead of Kuldeep Yadav. How shattering would that be for confidence? And do you think that was the right call? I have to be very carefully managed. I mean, he's, you know, a lot of wrist spinners have, um, have to put up with a lot of stuff. Um, it's not an easy job. And, you know, he's, ha- he's had a weird couple of years. Like, he's had a lot of ups and downs, um, you know. Bad IPL, then then comes back and does really well. Then a World Cup that starts very well, and then uh, then he gets taken apart by England, and then does really well in Test cricket, and then in and particularly in Australia, uh, and then has a sort of couple of okay but okay to mediocre IPLs, and 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 isn't a regular in the in the white ball teams anymore, and doesn't play another Test match, and but is bowling really well, and is still you know. Bharat Arun was not the only one, you know, Virat Kohli also bigged him up at that press conference. Ravi Shastri has bigged him up in the past. I would have picked him going into the test match. I would have picked him, Ashwin and Washington yeah. going into the test match. That was what I said on a few different platforms, I think possibly including this one. Um, and I mean, it does seem as look, it does seem as though they were planning perhaps on going in with uh, with Ashwin, Kuldeep and Akshar until Akshar got injured and then they needed to the extra batting and then maybe the extra control of Shabazz Nadim, which in you know like, you know there's an argument for that. I thought it was a conservative choice, um, not necessarily an indefensible one, but a conservative one. And Shabazz Nadim didn't have a great Test match. He, it took him a lot, a, a couple of spells to really get into his rhythm in the in the first innings, and obviously he got a uh, got a pair, I think. And then again, you bowled again. England would go for quick runs, so I don't think the figures in the second innings are a bit misleading. Um, but he, he he bowled no more than than okay. Um, I would have picked Kuldeep Yadav before the start of the test match. Now, and this result, nothing. Kuldeep Yadav for the second test. Yeah, I was, I was just about to say nothing has really changed in that regard. I would pick uh, Kul- if if Ashwin is fit, that would be the only change I would make. Uh, would be Kuldeep for for Shabazz and Nadim. Interesting if Ashwin was roughed up more than we than we thought from uh, the um, from that excellent spell of short bowling from Jofra Archer. Um, then maybe you. I would actually be very tempted to bring in Mohammad Siraj. Uh, and play the third uh, fast bowler, which I wasn't an advocate of going into this test match. But I think that uh, um, given that Washington is essentially a batter who sometimes bowls, really, uh, you'd be going in with uh, with him and then, you know, Kuldeep as the sole spinner. I think you would then need the extra wicket-taking potential of Mohamed Siraj. Uh, you know, we've seen how much this, this pitch has in it for... Well, I say this pitch, it's obviously going to be a completely fresh pitch uh, for, the, for the second test match, so who knows. Um, 
but I would go with the extra wicket taking ability of Mohammed Siraj over the um, the unproven. I say unproven. Siraj has only played a couple of Test matches, but over the sort of steadier, again conservative bowling all rounder type of uh, of Akshar Patel. Um, but it, it, yeah, if yeah, I, I would like to see Guldeep playing the, the next Test match. Now moving slightly to India's batting, India's number five and vice captain Ajinkya Rahane. Except for the 100 he got in Australia, he's not been in great form recently. At what point does that become a concern for the Indian team? Oh, look, it'll be a talking point and it'll be something he'll be trying to work out. He's never been a particularly good starter at the start of his innings. And, you know, he got a, he got out to a very good catch in the first innings, you know, slightly mistiming a full toss and then got a very good delivery when he wasn't set in the in the second innings. Rahane's a, you know, he's a slightly odd cricketer anyway. He tends to only score runs when no one else is scoring runs and he tends to do a lot better away from home unlike most yeah, he batters. averages and, under and, 40 in the last four years in india which is not yeah, I mean, uh, which is very underwhelming for an indian batsman because if you if we were comparing it to the rest of the top 6 everyone in india averages over 40 except for jinkya rahane who averages 37.8 i think it is yeah and he's not a great starter against spin and he never really has been it's a, he his game is unusual i mean it is certainly true that indian test pitches are nowhere near uh, are actually quite even for spinners and, and fast bowlers in the last um, few years. Um, the the spin bowlers uh, take their wickets actually at a worse average and economy rate and strike rate than the fast bowlers in, in Indian fast bowlers in the last uh, four years. Um, but but yeah, uh, obviously it's a talking point and it's not it's not good news that Rahane his his batting tailed off after that MCG hundred, which was a stunning innings, um, and he didn't get any runs in this innings. But I don't think it's um, I would assume and hope that India wouldn't panic about that. Um, I mean, who would they even bring in? You know, Mayank yeah, Agarwal so into the middle I order? Ask you, uh, with KL Rahul and Hardik Pandey presumably brought in just as a batsman, both of them waiting in the wings and KL Rahul playing as a middle order in the one days and T20s, and both KL and Hardik being younger than Rahane, who's now about to be 33 or is already 33. Surely at some point, you know, if you keep performing like this inconsistently, the Indian... Uh, team management just goes. You know what? You were a vice. You are a vice captain. But in the last couple of years, you haven't pulled your weight. We have younger players waiting, who are the future of Indian Test cricket. We have to give them a chance at some point. Oh, uh, there'll be a lot of. This is how it works in in all successful teams and in good teams. I mean, there's guys below uh, KL Rahul and uh, and Hardik Pandya. Who I, Hardik is not. Hardik is a specialist batsman. Is not a. Is yeah. not a long term option, and it's not how India want him to. Uh, to go. KL Rahul is an opener. I know he's a batted in the middle order, but he's an opener. Maya Gagarwal had to come down into the middle order uh, for that one test in, in Brisbane, but he's an opener. Uh, you got Hanumur Vihari, who is not in the yeah, squad. I forgot a, to mention him, sorry. But, um, yeah, who's had a slightly, odd, slightly odd career, and he's kind of been stop and start and the spare batter, and you know he's had a brilliant first-class record. And there'll be... Uh, India has this long history of, you know, there's a lot of guys scoring a lot of runs in the Ranji Trophy and in India A, and if somebody loses form, then they've got someone to replace them. But I, that conversation doesn't need to happen yet. Um, for we'll for the the whole series And then if he doesn't perform throughout the series, then that conversation starts to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I would. I mean, possibly not even then, because uh, India then have a tour of England coming up where Rahane, I think, will be very important. Uh, it can be very tempting sometimes to drop a Jinkya Rahane for someone who's flashier and who... Um, you know, passes the eye test a bit better. I think it's always a mistake. Um, a Jinkya Rahane has been a very very important part of this of this indian team um you know it's a minor point to mention his slip catching which is very good but um because i don't think that obviously that doesn't and there's uh, make of up, course you know, he brings a lot of runs. leadership skills as well which helps virat kohli quite a bit and has yeah as well yeah for sure i mean uh, slightly less so now that roy sharma is also in the uh in the team but obviously he's um he's even older than uh than uh, i think he might be the same age actually as a uh, as a jinkir ahane yeah. um but no i wouldn't i wouldn't be it's very easy to overreact to a, to a loss, but I think it's something that a good team doesn't do, and I think it's something that India should not do. Yeah, and coming to the loss, another Indian batter whose dismissal, in my opinion, changed the game in the first innings was a Jinkya uh, Sorry, was Cheteshwar Pujara. Now Pujara was batting really well. Pujara was doing Pujara things, steadying the innings. He was doing well alongside Rishabh and then he has that freak dismissal, where. I think nine times out of ten that would have gone for a four. The one time it didn't go for a four, it hit the short legs body and swooped up in the air. So and you could see the anger in his face because there was a hundred in there for him. He hasn't scored a hundred in a short while. But by his standard, it's been a while anyway. 
and his he you could see the disappointment in his face and was that one of the turning points of the game the fact that they got pujara out yeah potentially i mean you know pujara is someone who you know will happily bat for all five days of a test match um I mean, given opportunity obviously that would not be actually very helpful for your team but anyway you take my point um yeah, Pujada had not looked in trouble at all. He was scoring pretty fluently off the spinners, as he often, as he always does, actually. To be fair, uh, you know, he was he was finding run scoring relatively easy, and he and he and Punt were going along very nicely. And you know, Pujada very happy just to paddle along in Punt's slipstream and pick up, you know, two and a half runs and over, three runs and over. Um, and then yeah, it was a complete freak dismissal. You know, um, that Ollie Pope back headering it basically to to Rory Burns. So he took a very simple catch that could have gone anywhere. Uh, even firstly. The chances are you'll miss the short leg, or the short leg will dive out of the way. Ollie Pope was pretty brave slash stupid. No, no, I'm going to say brave because he, you know, he did duck it, but he got, but he stayed in line and he kept his eye on the ball. Chances are it misses the short leg. Chances are that if it hits the short leg, it goes absolutely nowhere. Um, there's no legislating for a dismissal like that, and I think it's a testament to Pujara that it takes either a freak dismissal or an unbelievably good bit of bowling to get him out a lot of the times. He has a tendency to attract unplayable deliveries from the opposition's best bowler. Uh, I think Jimmy Anderson's done him a couple of times like that. Yeah. Dale Stain, Patrick Cummins, Josh Hazelwood. Um, you know, this is the caliber it takes to get someone like uh, Chateshro Pujada out. Um, he got, it wasn't not so much in, in the second innings where he wasn't quite as set. It was a good delivery though from, from Leach and it did uh, jump from a length and it was a very good catch by Ben Stokes actually diving to his left at uh, uh, slip England caught brilliantly in this in this test match uh, yeah, India had a few heart England was so good that India needed to take all the half chances like there's the one down the leg side in the very in the first I think the second over uh, Boomer's first ball in fact of the test match that Richard Punt doesn't quite get a full hand to there's the one that uh, Ashwin can't quite get to running back towards the boundary uh, and I you know Boomer's in swinging Yorker to Ben Stokes that goes just past the stumps and yeah, that and this, was the next point I was actually going to come to was India's poor fielding and bowling discipline now conceding over 20 no balls and six of them in the second inning just from spinners that's a crime cardinal sin as they call it isn't it like that was the di- I feel like that was one of the di- things that made a difference not directly but indirectly it was kind of pulling india down with the number of extras they were giving away and their poor fielding do you think that was a major major reason of for their loss i wouldn't say a major reason it's obviously a factor um yeah i mean the no balls um you know uh, eight in the first innings from the spinners ashwin bowled to admittedly in 55 he's never, overs he's never bowled a no ball in his career up till this point i think never been called for one it's important to note that you know the tv umpire is now calling all no balls yeah. Uh, in almost real time, so you will get a lot more no balls called. That said, I think England only bowled one in the entire, no, two in the entire Test match. Leach bowled one, uh, and Joffrey Archer bowled one. But England, England have um, really paid attention to the no balls in white ball cricket as well as red ball cricket, and actually started in white ball cricket. They, when the free hit rule was brought in for front foot for any no balls, uh, they went ten thousand deliveries in one day international cricket without bowling a line no ball. Um, so I think it's a couple of years actually over that over that time. It's a, and it's something they really practice. Um, that didn't seem to be the case so much for uh, for India who look, who weren't really paying too much attention to the front line. I'm sure it's something Bharat Arun will be will be looking at. Um, you know, Ishant bowled five in the first innings. Boomerah bowled seven. Both of those have had no ball issues in the past, uh, and they they bowled no balls in the second. I'm just looking at the scorecard. Uh, Boomerah bowled one in the in the second innings and. In, uh, uh, and, Ash- and Ishanti who has had that issue didn't look it, it's a minor factor and it doesn't help um, um, obviously but it wasn't a major factor and yeah, I'd say the fielding India Rohit Sharma dropped that very simple catch but their runs were already on the board by that point mm-hmm. um, to, to, a, to a great extent um, and that's why everyone found it so hilarious including Rohit um, and there were you know there were half chances taken and not taken England are a better fielding team overall Obviously, India don't have Jadeja, who's their best fielder. Um, I think he's the best in the world, to be honest, Jadeja. Uh, he's got to be in. He's got to be in that conversation, doesn't he? He's a, he's a phenomenal uh, fielder. You think of that run out that he pulled off uh, to get World, rid of World Cup. Smith in Australia, and the World Cup as well. That's the uh, run out I remember, the bullet throw in the 2019 World Cup against New Zealand. Well, no, uh, it was Steve Smith. It wasn't. Uh, uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might, I mean, MS, MS Dhoni was a victim of a of a bull, of a bullet throw from Martin Guptill in that semi final. Yeah, in the, yeah, I remember that in the World Cup. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Jadeja obviously is a huge miss. Um, that said, India still had a very 
you know a team cap- well capable of winning this uh this match and you know god knows if we've seen anything in the last uh few months it's that teams missing their best players can can win test matches even away from home um yeah. no it was joe roots runs in the first innings um aided by sibley batting through the entire day pretty much and then ben stokes counter-attacking um Shabazz and Nadeem and Washington Sundar not really pulling their weight with the ball and India probably picking the wrong uh, attack. So essentially only going with in the sort of three and a half bowlers, three and a half, three very good bowlers, but still. Um, and then really good disciplined bowling from, from England in, in both innings and a period of absolutely unplayable bowling from James Anderson in the second to, innings. Yeah, and we'll come to Jimmy now because a lot of the chat before this series was while Jimmy Anderson's got 600 plus wickets, he's never really done it in the subcontinent. He goes to Sri Lanka, takes wickets, comes to India, now changes the game. I can happily say he changed the game. The, those two wickets in that over, he got, I think he was 3 for 15? Was it, what were the figures he ended with? Something like- he ended up with figures of uh, 11 overs, 4 mains, seven, 3 for 17. I think yeah, at one point he was on... changing figures. I, I think at one point he was on 3 for 8. Yeah, and that's mad. Like, people... I can't believe people till today question Jimmy Anderson's greatness. And I, I love the fact that England, uh, England's social media team put out a picture of a Jimmy Anderson celebrating his wicket. And the caption was, no clouds in the sky. Weird that, isn't it? <laughs> something like that. But it was quite funny because obviously that's something people call him out for. I don't know why we live in a genera- We live in an age where people love to deny people of their credentials. Like, oh... Yeah, he's done this, but he hasn't done that. Instead of just accepting that someone's great. And I feel like Jimmy has kind of shut all those critics up. And he's getting better with age. I think he's got uh, 343 wickets now after passing the age of 30, which is tied with Anil Kumble. And I think Murli Tharan, Rangana Herat, and there was one more bowler. I can't remember who. Uh, I think it might have been Shane Wan. They're the only three people above him who've got more wickets than him after passing the age of 30. So that's like... You have to give him credit where it's due when his back was against the wall and he was being questioned. He pulls out something at the age of 38. Is he 38 now? Yeah. Older than one of the umpires in this test match. Yeah. Yeah, you put out a tweet about it. So how good was Jimmy? Man, I, James Anderson. People have been on James Anderson retirement watch since the 13-14 Ashes. Yeah. Um, There's a stat from Andy Zaltzman, um, the, the, the comedian statistician, who I think is the BBC's statistician now. Since the since the first summer of twenty fourteen, he's taken two hundred and sixty eight wickets at twenty one, uh, everywhere in the world, um, and you know the you know the classic cliches about he gets better with age and fine wines and all this, but yeah, he knows his game so well. He's incredibly physically fit. Um, he keeps himself in such good shape. Uh, you can see that by the way he feels. Uh, yeah, and he said on his podcast, the one he does called Tail Enders, where he says retirement couldn't be the furthest thing from his mind because he feels really good. Yeah, I, I, of course he does. I mean, uh, he uh, and he's bowling brilliantly. I mean, he's been unplayable in England for the last few years, and he's he's taken he's done he has done well in, the, in India before. He was a major part of the win in twenty twelve. Uh, the the last time India won a series, India lost a series rather at home. He was a major part in that. Uh, he did okay in twenty sixteen seven in twenty sixteen, but with no support. Did okay in the twenty seventeen eighteen Ashes, and sometimes better than that again with. He and Broad had no support from anyone else. Um, but he is so absolutely in control of everything that he is doing with the ball. And you see it in all these little things. Like He's not the only bowler who hides the ball when he's running into... Yeah. Um, you know, Zahir Khan has Anderson been did that for a long time. Yeah, yeah, for a long time. And Anderson does that as well. And, you know, a lot of other... I think Chaminda Vas may even have done that since, from... And Wasi Makram. And I think um, Srinath you know, used Javago Srinath used to do it as well. Yeah, all of these great fast bowlers who who get reverse swing do the, do this sort of thing. Um, but his his control of when to bowl that delivery, uh, when to bowl this setting delivery, setting the batsman up. Yeah, setting the batsman up, and he his his mind's like a supercomputer um, of because uh, he's got all of this experience and all of this skill and all of this ability to work out exactly what to do and then do it. Um, and yeah, of course, like, he's 38, so every time he has a bad-ish test match, you know, people start talking. Um, and, you know, the same was true with Stuart Broad until, um, who's quite a bit younger uh, than uh, than Anderson, he's three years younger. Um, you know, that's just part of the course, but he is a phenomenal bowler, um, and a phenomenal bowler everywhere in the world. I think his average in the subcontinent is now around about 30. 
uh, maybe a little bit less. Yeah, he's dropped uh, below now. 30 for the first time in a long time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, those you know, that's, those stats need to be dug into further because, you know, there's some very good series and some not-so-good series at the start of his career. Um, but he has been an extraordinary bowler and will continue to be an extraordinary bowler. He uh, He's now on, I think, 611 test wickets. Yeah, yeah uh, I think he'll cross 700 personally. Uh, he could well do. I mean, because particularly given how many test matches in India in, in are playing this year, he could do it this year, uh, frankly. So, um, uh, so yeah, he, uh, you know, he he's going to overtake to Anil Kumble Jimmy pretty the soon. Bowler, to Jimmy the mentor a little, I think Jimmy Anderson. Every time Jofra Archer was bowling, I couldn't help but notice Jimmy Anderson was either at mid off or mid on, always having a chat with Jofra Archer. How much of a role does he have in grooming? not just him, but obviously Stuart Broad when he plays as well. How much of a responsibility do they have in grooming the next generation of fast bowlers? Mark Wood coming through, Jofra Archer himself. I think they're trying to groom Jofra Archer as the leader of the attack for the future. And how important will Jimmy and Broad's uh, input be to that? Yeah, massive. You'd have to be an idiot not to learn from from those guys and being being around them all the time and just how they prepare and how they go about things. And Archer's a clever bowler and he's someone who takes on advice very well. And, you know, it's like, a, you know, it's the same thing that India do with Ishan Sharma. Like, he, he's always talking to Bumrah or, or whoever else. And, you know, if Siraj plays, it'll be the same. Or when uh, yeah, Bumrah, and Sh- Shami, Bumrah, Shami, Bhavneshwar Kumar have all credited Ishan Sharma a big reason for the successful careers they've had so far. Umesh Yadav as well, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, and he's exactly the same uh, with any with any great fast bowling. I mean, Anderson and Broad are kind of on the same, are kind of peers in that sense. And they, and they kind of plot things uh, plot things out uh, like that, but um, yeah, so it, it, it's massive. It's all it's all part of the it's all part of the factor. It's all part of the thing, um, and it's all part of the thing of having all this experience and being able to pass it on and knowing how to communicate it to um, to to your bowl, to your captain and to your other bowlers and and to the rest of your team and to be able to sum up conditions. Like that. I mean, that's what is. I mean, that's what's so good about a lot of the fast bowlers on this on this uh, in this match. Uh, Anderson is very is unbelievable at summing up conditions very quickly broad when he plays ashwin Bumrah, which is incredible even given how few test matches he's uh he's played and you'll see it um in archer is developing it very rapidly um and it means that you don't get any wasted deliveries really um everything with anderson is part of the plan uh almost always yeah and lastly obviously uh what lastly before we do our predictions for the rest of the series because it's shown our initial predictions right off what's just happened but uh i'm gonna ask you any changes from either team in the second test what would they be yeah i I put out a a tweet with us already my predicted changes i the one for england i mostly there'll be an enforced one for england because josh butler's going home so ben folks will come in as a wicket keeper Mm -hmm. um doesn't i mean butler had an okay test match with the bat not a brilliant one um but he kept very well Ben Folkes is widely regarded as the best wicketkeeper in England, perhaps the best wicketkeeper in the world. Also a very, very handsome man. A very handsome. Um, he's a gorgeous man to look at. He really is. Um, and then the Anderson Broad thing is really interesting. Um, it depends whether the conversation's already been had. Mm-hmm. If the conversation has already been had that says uh, Broad's in for the next test match, England will stick with that, part of the prior planning. Uh, if not, and there's some room for, for debate, I would not be at all surprised if Anderson plays and then they uh, save Stuart Broad to come in for the for the day-night test, the, the pink ball test in Ahmedabad. Uh, for India, um, kind of said it already at the, earlier in the show, Kuldeep Yadav for Shabazz Nadeem. Uh, you know, it's very easy to look wise after the event, but you know, I'm on record as saying that that would be what I've gone for. And then if Ashwin isn't fit, then I would go for Mohammed Siraj. If Ashwin is fit, then I'd, then I'd keep with that. So, um, yeah one maybe two changes per side um i would say definitely one maybe two um i wouldn't go any further than that yeah and obviously with england taking the one lead i just want to tell everyone who's listening the impact it has on the world test championship standings now for india to qualify for the final they either need to win the series 2-1 or 3-1 if they win just one of the test matches neither of the team goes through so, and for England to go through, they need to now win the series either 3-0, 4-0, or 3-1. They've already got up to 1-0, so they need to win the remaining two out of the three test matches. 
who knows what will happen test cricket's weird now <laughs> Every, everything's happening you can't predict it but i will make you do the impossible nakul predict the rest of the series i had said 3-0 before the start of the series to india even though i couldn't really see where the draw was coming from and that's because i knew how hard it was going to be and how well things would have to go for england to win a test they did that they played brilliantly throughout India were slightly below par. The half chances went England's way. They they didn't go India's way. India didn't, India didn't quite pick the right team, maybe. Um, but, you know, Joe Root played one of the... I, mean, I don't know exactly where it stands in the pantheon. It's too early to say that, but played a wonderful innings. And Anderson was superb, and they were backed up by, by the rest of the team. It happened. In, in England have won. Um, I would still think that India are the better team, particularly in these conditions. Uh, they have... Uh, the better potential bowling lineup, and particularly when Jadeja is back, but I think even possibly without um, no, 50-50 call. I mean, Ashwin's that much better than uh, than, than Bess and Leach uh, and have a, a lot of very good batters and have this incredible home record and this incredible confidence in their own abilities. First, uh, first loss at Chennai in 22 years. First loss in India for since 2017 and only yeah, their second eight in matches. eight. It was their second in eight years. It's longer than that. I think it's it was 16 wins on the bounce, I think it was, yeah. uh, for, for for India. Maybe 17? I forget exactly the number. But it's a lot, anyway. Um, so I would still be predicting 3-1 to India, and then India joining New Zealand in that World Test Championship final. But I mean, actually, in a weird way, the, the people who will be celebrating this most are Australia, because a drawn series, a 1-0 win for India, which obviously is now impossible, or a 2-1 win for England sends Australia through to the World Test Championship final despite those uh, point deductions and despite losing that home series. Look, I think India are still favourites to win the series. Um, and I would I would say 3-1. Um, but, um, but look, uh, it's set up the series beautifully, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And I'm personally looking forward to it because obviously I don't like series that are like just one-sided, completely one-sided. They're just no fun to watch. And obviously, Test Cricket has had this resurgence in the last two, three months with... Some brilliant games all Wait, over Three, the four years. There, I think maybe the, apart from the 17-18 Ashes, which was a pretty dull series, mm -hmm. there has barely been a bad test match uh, or bad series yeah, in the I, last four years. You go back to that India-Australia series in 2017 was a cracking series. Um, and, you know, um, even before that, India, England and Bangladesh, even though it was a really good series in 2016. I mean, uh, go on and on and on and on. You're seeing teams starting to win away from home now. You're seeing teams win away from home with... Really, like, the West Indies team, like, how many of those would you pick in a first choice 11? None of the batters, really. Maybe Brathwaite and Campbell. Um, yeah. India winning with India winning, you know, you know, one injury away from Bharat Arun playing in the uh, <laughs> playing or Sridhar coming back out of retirement. Uh, uh, all of this stuff, um, you know, New Zealand winning in the UAE. Uh, all yeah. of this, like, Test cricket is an incredible place right now. Um, diving and it's put a lot of those rumors to rest, right? A lot of those naysayers, not rumors. To rest, who keeps saying, oh, Test Cricket's dying. T20 in one day is the way forward. Test Cricket's proved, even with the modern day players, the, maybe the style has changed a little bit. Players are way more attacking and they're doing the unthinkable, chasing 300 in a day, 400 in a day sometimes. And Test Cricket's beautiful, man. It's just great. And it's great to see players adapting and doing well as well. Yeah, man, great players adapt. I, like, it, I think it's, it's important to note, good players have egos. Test cricket is where you make your legend. I, that's not completely true because you know Owen Morgan is a forever legend now. You know he and he's never had much. Yuvraj Singh but... didn't do too well at Test level. Yeah, but... exactly. And Yuvraj is very possibly in an India all-time eleven for in in One Day International uh, cricket. Uh, you know, a large part of MS Dhoni's legend is is. But, and, and you know, there are also players. Well, I think I wouldn't put Rohit Sharma right up there in Test cricket. I mean, yeah, yeah, you can have these players, but but but. Uh, you know, Virat Kohli knows this more than anyone. Yeah. Um, He's changed the way Test cricket's played in India. So, uh, Virat Kohli knows this more than anyone. You know, you become an all-time great and you become a legend largely through your performances in in Test cricket, and it, it's where and it is incredibly satisfying to win Test matches because it's so hard because Test cricket is so bloody difficult. Not that the other formats aren't in a different way, but Test cricket is incredibly draining mentally and physically, and it takes a lot to win Test matches consistently. And players know that, and the you know that search for greatness. Uh, is is part of what keep keeps Test cricket not just alive but thriving. I have a book that is a collection of 
cricket letters written, written to the Daily Telegraph since they started uh, their letters page. It's called Not In My Day, Sir. And I think it may even be earlier. The earliest reference that I've found to someone saying yeah, test cricket is dying cool. was 1912. Ah. In fact, actually, no, you go back even further. The Ashes. The the myth of the Ashes starts with a mock obituary published uh, when England lose to Australia. A mock obituary is published in the paper that tells that the stumps will be burnt and put in an urn and sent to Australia. Thus, the myth of the Ashes was born. That is in the late. That is in the eighteen eighties. Like Test cricket is the only sport that's been dying since before it was invented. If you if you believe popular opinion, um, but it's in a wonderful place right now. The cricket, in some ways, needs to get out of its own way and just stop hamstringing itself with all of the competitive disadvantages and the financial imbalances and the ridiculous scheduling and all of these things and its lax attitudes to doping and all of this, all of these things and um, actually televising itself. Like no one could watch that west indies chase the other day uh, you had to really hunt to try and find it um, and it's ridiculous um and all of these things are true but the actual cricket is being played in an incredibly exciting manner uh that cannot help to in but enthrall um we're in a golden age of test cricket and just is delightful to be able to watch all of it yeah and i'm looking forward to the second test now in chennai i think it starts on the 14th Starts on Saturday morning. Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, Saturday morning. So that's the thirteenth. So <coughs> I'll have a catch up with you again at the end of the second test. Hopefully, thank you for joining me for this at such short notice, and thank you guys for watching.